Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we may have some more people uh, straggling in as, as we move forward, but uh, since we only have an hour, we'll go ahead and get the ball rolling. Uh, thank you for coming out to Integrating Research and Education. So glad you guys can be here. I think this is going to be a very helpful workshop. My name is Evangeline Keepek. I work with the Office of Proposal Development. And uh, we have some handouts over there on the table uh, for you guys, uh, some pamphlets. And also, I believe the Mag Lab also brought some pamphlets <laughs> over, so check those out. Uh, some of the stuff that we have are the uh, representative activities from NSF, National Science Foundation. Uh, this basically explains what uh, educational activities and broader impacts are in uh, and what they're looking for in those statements um, across their grants, so career as well as the other NSF grants that are out there. So really nice, uh, clean cut handout there. We also have examples of broader impact statements from NS NSF career grants. Uh, these are generously um, given by four of FSU's awardees of the NSF career grant. These are their broader impact statements. So you can see what some award-winning examples look like. And then we also have a handout with our uh, the slideshows, places to write notes. There's a calendar of upcoming OPD events if you're interested. And then if you are able, we would love for you to fill out a feedback form. Uh, this really helps us give you the best workshops and serve you better. Um, so let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, and uh, you can just leave it on that table at the end of the workshop. So, Integrating research and education means showing that your research includes significant educational activities above and beyond what is normally required of you as a professor. Uh, while this workshop was set up as a part of our NSF career grant series, it is also applicable to those outside of the science fields uh, because a lot of grants out there right now are looking for ways that your research can help the community, can educate those around you. So there's something for everyone here today. Uh, now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our panelists. We have uh, the professor at the Department of Biological Sciences, Austin Vast, and uh, the director of the Center for Integrating Research and Learning at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, Dr. Roxanne Hughes, uh, also the director of Evaluation and Postdoc Liaison at the Center for Integrated Research and Learning, Carrie Lee Roberts. And lastly, but also our first to present today, is the director of Office of Science Teaching Activities, Dr. Ellen Granger. So Ellen, we'll go ahead and begin with you. So the, um, our office has been around since 1983, and we've been supporting faculty in um, the research, uh, their efforts to extend their research into educational areas since that time. We have a lot of established programs, and I'm going to walk you through some of those, because some people like to join into our established programs as part of their educational outreach. Um, for a career grant, it certainly won't, shouldn't be all of your educational outreach, but it can be a, a good part of it. And sometimes so we've even had faculty who've designed special modules for some of our programs as a part of their outreach. And then I will, I will talk a little bit about um, the other support that we can give you if you don't really fit with one of our programs at all. So these two programs have been around since, 19, uh, well the one on the left has been around since 1985, the one on the right since 1999. <clears throat> Saturday at the Sea is a program for middle school students, so if you do any kind of environmental work or coastal work, this is a good one for you to participate in. We take uh, classes of uh, middle school students from nine county region down to the coast uh, two days a week, uh, April through November, and they get an environmental experience um, down there. Oftentimes faculty 
join in with us and um, design activities for this program. The one that's actually <clears throat> a little bit better for the kind of uh, outreach that you need to do is the summer camp that built off of Saturday at the Sea. These are week-long summer camps where the students are doing an inquiry at the Marine Lab. And it's not unusual for us to have a faculty member design an inquiry experience for the students that they can engage in um, for that week. It has to be something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end in a week. <laughs> um, because the students do do a presentation at the end of the week to their parents and some interested faculty members. So that's another program that you could join. Um, the next slide. This is our oldest program, and this is a program that anybody in any research area can be a part of. It's called a Young Scholars Program. <clears throat> it's been around since 1983 here at FSU. We bring in 40 rising seniors from high schools all over Florida. These are top science and math students in Florida. It's quite competitive to get into the program. It's a six-week summer residential program. And we're always looking for faculty to sponsor students in research in their labs. Um, we like to place students in pairs or sometimes even in triads in labs because that way they have a, a colleague that's the, at the same level as they are. Uh, frequently what they do is work very closely with a graduate student or a technician on a, <clears throat> on a little sub-project or sometimes even just part of your main project. But this is a way that you can reach out to the schools. We've also brought in teachers with students as well, and so teachers and students have participated in labs um, in the past. That's a little trickier because adults <clears throat> um, typically don't like leaving home for six weeks in the summer, but we have had teachers, local teachers, who have um, been able to manage that. Then we have a whole suite of other programs if you're interested. There's a C to C, that's a, taking um, the C to elementary school classrooms. Science on the, on the Move is a physical science van program. It takes physical science activities to classrooms in the nine county region. Uh, we've had faculty design activities for that. Uh, people who are in physics or chemistry have designed activities for that that go, becomes part of the outreach that that, that program does. Science on the Move sees about 5,000 kids a year. So it's a big program, it, it's very active. <clears throat> and then we do a lot of teacher professional development. And I frequently have faculty become part of teacher professional development, um, often the content part of teacher professional development. We're working on how to teach and they also, the best way to <clears throat> help teachers learn how to uh, enhance their teaching is through enhancing their content. So we oftentimes will combine those things together. Because we do teacher professional development all over the state of Florida, we have contacts, and the Young Scholars Program is all over the state of Florida. We have contacts in schools um, all over the state and with school district science supervisors all over the state. And if you are interested in developing some kind of an outreach program for K-12 teachers, we can help you, connect you with people anywhere in the state. Um, and help you find uh, teachers that are interested in, in doing um, more science and enhancing their science activities. I put my contact down the bottom. I think that's my last slide, isn't it? Yeah, yes. <laughs> Can you go back one? I put my contact down at the bottom. <clears throat> I would, if you have any questions, I know we're supposed to take them at the end. I have a terrible cold. <laughs> I came in today just to do this. So if you have questions, um, for me now, I'd like to answer them now. Um, if you're not interested in any of these programs, uh, our office is the um, STEM outreach office for the College of Arts and Sciences, and I've uh, frequently helped faculty who have ideas that are outside of any of our programs hone their, hone their ideas, write them up in a way uh, that um, makes it look like you actually are an expert in education. <laughs> um, because there are, you know, there are red flags that you don't want to put in your educational outreach text. Um, anybody reading it would know this person really doesn't know anything about education. So um, we work closely with faculty to help them hone the text, uh, connect them with uh, sometimes citations from the literature, which often faculty aren't familiar with because it's outside of their areas. We're happy to do that as well. Um, 
as you can see, this is only part of what I do, so I have a lot going on. I'm happy to help you, but you don't contact me like my grant's due in a week. <laughs> Can you help me write this section? Because sometimes I, I just have my, my schedules all booked up. But if you give me um, plenty of time, I'm happy to help anybody who needs help. Any questions? Is your office only intending to work with faculty that are in arts and sciences? Or? Actually, um, no. Okay. I mean, we're set up for that. We're set up as the outreach, but we've had engineering faculty. Our Young okay. Scholars program, we place students in, in the College of Medicine and Engineering and Human Sciences sometimes. Um, so we place students all over, and I've helped faculty from uh, outside of the College of, Edu of Arts and Sciences as well. Yes, ma'am. For the C2C program, are these going to be in the classroom as part of the curriculum, or are these external to these like after school programs? They're actually, they, they'll go, um, an elementary school will schedule them to come in and they'll um, see classes for an hour all day long. So different classes will come during the school day. <clears throat> they'll come in, they'll do an hour long. It's kind of a uh, habitat uh, environmental experience for the kids. They have touch tanks where the students get to explore some very hardy uh, invertebrates, think about how they fit with the environment, how their structure and, uh, and fu uh, functions in the environment, why they're built the way they're built. And um, so that, that program as well sees five to 6,000 kids a year because when you go to a school and you have a class coming in for an hour for a six hour day, that's, you know, um, 125 students you can you'll see in a day so, so that if you want to use this program there's something that you have to, you have to have a conversation around mm -hmm. okay. just contact us and all these different programs there are six faculty in my office and the different programs have, have their own directors and I can put you in contact with the directors of the various programs and they'll sit down with you to help you design something and then I'm usually the one that helps you work on the text for your Any other questions? Other questions? Yes. If someone's looking to do this in the near future, how soon should they contact you? It sounds like this is a um, summer. Yeah, so soon, yes, summer is our busiest season. <laughs> and um, I have, like, pretty much the whole month of June, I'm doing teacher professional development. And then I have two uh, NSF research, educational research grants that have activities going in the in July. So contact me soon. I know career grants are due in the summer. In so July. Like this one. July. Yeah, because people are always contacting me when I'm in professional development season. So but if we reached out in May, that would May would be great. May's okay. a good month for me because I'm done with teaching and it's before I pick up with the with the awesome. K twelve stuff. And, and now works as well. Yeah, now works as well too. Any anything else? Well, if any other questions come up, Dr. Roxanne Hughes knows my programs well, and she could probably answer questions for me later on, too. All right, thank you. Thank you, Alice. So All right, so next we will hear from the professor at the Department of Biological Science, Dr. Austin Mass. And you want to take over the Catherine's chair. You know, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Yes, so I have two slides. One slide is what am I doing, and one slide is what uh, about resources that you might find useful within the Citizen Science Association. So I, I studied, among several things, biodiversity informatics, which is sitting at the intersection of biodiversity research and data science. And a lot of the data is coming from collections. Uh, there's a plant specimen shown here, but uh, we have about 3 billion specimens in the world of insects on pins and fish in jars and fossils in drawers and so on. And uh, much of that hasn't had digital data about it created yet. And NSF recognized about 10 years ago at the prompting of the community that this was a lost opportunity and they invested $100 million over 10 years to create digital data 
about specimens held in U.S. collections. As part of that, the uh, program funded uh, what they were calling a hub, uh, more formally a, a national resource for advancing digitization of biodiversity collections, and uh, that is IDIC Bio. IDIC Bio is based here at UF, and it's a $30 million 10-year project to facilitate the creation of digital data and the use of that data for research and education and outreach and other uses uh, in the U.S. And we help we grow up to 550 plus collections create digital images, CT scans, uh, database records, that sort of thing. So that's that's the backdrop that I thought I needed to explain before I uh, gave you information that answers why is this guy in front of you? <laughs> so uh, it's a big task, you know, a billion specimens, maybe we had 10% of them represented digitally 10 years ago. An opportunity to advance this a bit faster, to scale up by engaging a broader uh, set of people in the activity. And so we started to develop infrastructure that would enable anyone anywhere around the world to create data about the specimen. So this is a specimen, this is from a Florida collection, and, and here's a label, and it has some information on it. This is in Notes from Nature. Notes from Nature is a, uh, it's a site that's within the Zooniverse platform. Now, Zooniverse was created for crowdsourcing by the originally Oxford, but uh, this was done at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. And so we have this core activity, this creation of data about specimens that have some, you know, the visually appealing, they're historically appealing. Some of these things are dating back 150, 200 years. Why not open that out, open it up, so that we can engage more people in this activity, people who might really be interested in the data. And so we saw an opportunity to advance both the, the creation of the research data and advanced STEM literacy in this. And so we, we created this, we created um, another uh, piece of cyber infrastructure that allows for the deployment of what we call expeditions on this. These two pieces were funded later through a different NSF program, the uh, Advances in Biological Informatics program. And then we layered on top of it two other things, uh, among several things that I'll mention. But um, one is a global event in which we engage the community of universities, botanical gardens, museums, uh, for example, uh, you know, Yale's Peabody Museum, the Field Museum in Chicago, the Australian Museum, uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens Q in England, and, and the list goes on. Um, in on-site events for the creation of digital data about the specimens, hand in hand with collection tours, talks by research experts. This happens once a year. We did BIOS Worldwide Engagement for Digitizing Bio Collections. This is a community that we developed because we saw the success of doing this one four-day event each year. The rate was so high, we said, well, how can we sp spread this more evenly across the year? And, and so we developed this. This is We Dig Florida Plants, and I forgot what we had. But the, uh, you know, this is a uh, sea oats that's pixelating along with the G. This is what the community wanted. We had a, a workshop at UF, and we brought in uh, the Florida the Plant Society, the Florida Master Gardeners, Florida Master and others, and, and that's so, so how do we build this out in a way? How do, we, what do we, how do we layer resources on this core activity so that we could advance not just our goals, but also your goals? So Florida Native Plant Society has, has goals that are different from Florida Master Naturalists, has uh, different from Florida Master Gardeners, and so we were just taking stock for, you know, how do we, how do we make this align, this activity align with their needs? 
the point I want to make with all of this is that it, everything grew out of this fairly organically. I was at a conference last week, no, two weeks ago now, with uh, half a dozen uh, NSF program officers, and we were just standing around talking, and I brought up the fact that I was going to do this with this group. And, and the, the one thing that they said, you've got to, it's got to be there, is it's got to be organic. You know, it can't be this thing that you're adding on that you, you know, no matter how much tape you put on that thing, it's not going to stick very nicely to your research. So think about that. How, what feature of your research lends itself to some kind of broader impact? Today we're talking about education, but the you know, broader impacts broadly are what you need to have. And uh, all of this uh, can be uh, thought of leading to uh, my participation in this organization. Now I'm not just a member, I'm a board member of this organization. This is a 5,000 member organization, the Citizen Science Association. This is a smart group. This is, this is a group that has a lot of knowledge outside of whatever your do, domain expertise might be. Um, so if you're looking for a body of, of literature, a body of expertise in the membership, uh, you know, head over to this uh, group's website look through, there are several working groups that might be relevant to what you're trying to do, or not. You know, it might be totally outside of what you're trying to do, but this is a group that, you know, these are not, for the most part, these are not people that I would have normally interacted with on campus, but it's been a great experience working with them, understanding the process of evaluation, for example, uh, in a much more um, complete way with, with resources from this group. And evaluation is something that you'll uh, probably want to work on for your, uh, for your project. That's what I have to say. I don't think my, there won't be time for questions for me now, but later. Yeah, yeah, let's, we'll go ahead and take a look at what uh, Roxanne and Carrie have to show and then all three of you can have a nice um, group Q&A session, I think. Sounds great. Uh, but thank you so much, Austin, for all this yeah, good sure. information. All right. Roxanne Hughes, and um, we're going to uh, combine this um, project, so you can go to the next slide. We have a team of four. Um, we all couldn't be here today, but this gives you a sense of, we have a specialization. So we're over at the MAG Lab. Um, Dr. Granger talked about how she represents the College of Arts and Sciences. We have helped, my team and I have helped our faculty, that's who we have to help first, obviously. There, um, there are people, we're paid to help them. Um, but we also have worked closely with some engineering staff out on Innovation Park, but that doesn't mean that we can't um, provide some help, advice, or perhaps you'd like to see some of our programs. So that's gonna get us to um, our next slide here. Um, and you have a copy of this, so I'm not gonna read it all to you. Um, but we divided up our programs. We do um, pretty much K through 16 types of programs. They complement what Ellen's group does. Um, so we have K through 12 educational outreach. We reach about 5,000 students per year. Carlos Villa is our project management for that. He goes into schools as well as brings students to the Mag Lab for tours. All of our outreach have a Mag Lab science focus. You can go to our education website. There's 11 different kits. Um, but scientists, just like Ellen said, scientists have helped to create some of those kits. They're typically related to our Mag Lab science. That way NSF will pay for it. Um, and then our middle school mentorship, uh, complimentary to the Young Scholars, this is 20 students per year in the fall semester every Friday morning. They come to the Mag Lab, they are paired up with a scientist and they work on a research project and they present that um, at the end of the fall. And then our middle school summer camps, these are about 140 middle school students per year. 
Currently, we have um, Camp Tesla, which is our co-ed camp. That's a one-week camp. Our Sci Girls Coding, which is a one-week camp. Our Sci Girls Discover, which is a one-week camp. And our Sci Girls Quest, which is a two-week camp. Um, for this, we have metrics. And Carrie's going to talk about those in a little bit. But what we look at are improvements for our middle schoolers. We're looking at improvements in STEM identity, their sense of belonging in STEM fields, their sense of um, seeing themselves as able to be successful in the STEM fields, and we have um, uh, pre and post survey metrics that Carrie will talk about. Then for our outreach, we give surveys to our teachers um, to determine the impact of the outreach, whether that will be useful for the teachers. So we have an evaluation component, and I'll let Carrie go to that next slide to explain her role. So like Artsin said, all of our programs have their own education or evaluation process. And it's, it's strictly based off what are the goals of the program. So that ties right into how we measure success. And so for every program, we have kind of performance indicators and metrics. So the performance indicators are kind of quick numbers. So how many campers said they met a new STEM role model? That kind of like quick off the cuff numbers. And then the metrics are going to be things that are a little more in depth and that are typically measured with research based validated instruments. Um, so STEM identity is the big one for our middle school programs, and then um, with outreach, our classroom outreach, is, did teachers see uh, our educator modeling effective practices? And Carrie is a bona fide evaluator. So Austin hinted at the importance of evaluators in your um, grants, and it, NSF. For, that's what we know. NSF is really looking at evaluation as a component. Um, so then our more adult programs are our research experiences for undergraduates. That's what NSF calls the internship program for college students. 10-week summer program um, at the Mag Lab. We have a research experience for teachers program. Six-week summer program for K-12 teachers also at the Mag Lab. And then we have internship. So FSU, we've partnered with FSU's internship program. Um, and we will uh, bring a uh, college students as well as some high school students out to the lab. Um, but there are a number of, it's not just the MAG lab that does internships. So um, FSU has an intern program. You can connect with them to volunteer. Um, and we also have the UROP program here, undergraduate research opportunities at FSU. These are just some of the things that we do. Our numbers are um, small because we're, our limiting factor with this is our mentors. Um, and we're looking at, for each of these, we focused on, for our undergraduates, we look at researcher identity, their sense that they like research, they like doing research, and they see themselves as a success, successful researcher in the future. Um, for our RIT program, again, teachers and undergraduates for both of these programs are paired with a scientist and they work on a project throughout the summer. In that one, we're looking at their science um, teaching confidence. Do they feel more confident in their science content knowledge and teaching? And then internship, we're also looking at researcher identity. And I'll let Carrie explain a little bit more about those on the next slide. So with our adults, we can get a little bit deeper in the evaluation just because there's not as many restrictions on what we can and can't ask them. Um, so they, they will all get uh, pre-test, post-test surveys so before and after the program. We also do a lot more qualitative inquiry with them. So focus groups, interviews, we get that more in-depth data to see how individuals are impacted. Uh, instead of just a broad overview, we get the big overview with the surveys and the qualitative data lets us see how are individuals being impacted. So we can then report that back to NSF um, so they know that the programs are going well, their money's being well spent, and um, hopefully they are happy with those results. Um, the RU, RET, pre post survey, qualitative, and then the mentors we also interview to see from the mentor side, how do you think it went? What could we help do for you to help make this a more valuable program? Um, and we have gotten a lot of very valuable points of feedback from mentors too. So it's kind of a, a population that can be easily forgotten about, but it's still a valuable um, source of information to tap when you're looking at evaluating your programs. And then internship is the same general procedure. And then um, RU internship is research identity, so do they feel like they belong? Can they actually do this? And then for teachers, it's their confidence in science teaching. So can they take what they learned and then translate it back into their classrooms so that all that knowledge is then being dispersed to all their students? That's the big question, though. 
Um, and I want to also highlight that Carrie is, her title is postdoc liaison. The Mad Lab has a postdoctoral mentoring plan, and most NSF um, grants, I still think it's a requirement, NSF grants require you to have a postdoctoral mentoring plan. We are happy to share ours with you if you want to see. Obviously, yours would be a single PI, so it might look a little bit different. We're also happy to share surveys that we use if you want to borrow from those surveys. If you use them, we'd love to see the data, too. That helps us out to, to compare. Um, just like Ellen said, the summer is our busiest time, too. So if you needed help with anything, um, April and May are the best times to reach out to us. And if you reach out, I left the cards for all of our team. But like I said, Jose does our REU internship and RET program. Carlos Villa does our K through 12 um, camps and internship programs. Uh, but Carrie has also, uh, we track all of our postdocs and graduate students. Um, we find them on LinkedIn, is, is how we track them. But we actually have um, years worth of data going back about 20 graduate students that were with us 20 years ago, tracking them all the way now to see if they're in industry, academia. So we have some of that data as well, which could inform um, your studies if you're planning to work with graduate students or postdocs. Did I miss anything? Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we'll go ahead and devote the rest of the time to questions uh, for Roxanne and Carrie and for Austin. Uh, are there, and just if you want to do panel or, you know, it um, doesn't have to be super formal. So do we have questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, so could you uh, give us an example of maybe a, a PI that you worked with uh, who needed to find that integrating research and education um, angle for, for their grant proposal and how that went? Our, um, Christian Beekman is a physics faculty member that's affiliated out at the Mag Lab. Um, and she was able to talk to both my team as well as our public affairs team. Her interest was she wanted to do like a um, physics minute, like there's a medical minute on WFSU. Um, and she was able to talk through the idea and build on that and she was awarded um, a career grant. I don't know if that's one of the examples that you received, um, but just in talking to our team, she was able to kind of build on that idea. And I use that as an example as well because WFSU is part of FSU and a resource for you all. Um, Austin talked about citizen science. WFSU is always looking for partners of scientists. They do a lot of actual programs. Check out their, um, their website. But um, Christiane was able to work on um, a project and really improve it. Like Ellen said, you all aren't education isn't what you came into academia for and we were able to get that program to something that was um, obviously rewarded by the NSF career grant. I usually see people on the back end. Once their idea is solidified, how do you actually prove that it's doing what you set out to do? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm not a, I have, I have my own research. But uh, I'm happy to talk if people are interested. But I, I don't normally put myself out there to say, oh, let me help you <laughs> work on your proposals. I have several of my own to do at any one time. Awesome. I have a question about a comment you made, though, about the, like, it, sh it should feel organic. And I, th I think what's, like, so nice about your work is that the, the like, education piece is actually helping the research and advancing it. And that's obviously like the holy grail, but is that all that NSF wants to see? Or do they understand that sometimes you might have like very useful outreach that's not gonna then improve the research, it's just making sure that the research is getting out to the public? I, I think that science communication can certainly be part of your broader impact. Uh, so you're just sharing it with the world, mm -hmm. and making it relevant in a way that the relevance is clear to the audience. So. I, you know, the WFSU example would be a case where it's just, uh, you know, making it real. I, I like what I settled on because it, it gives 
teachers an opportunity to make it count, so to speak. You know, it's an authentic science experience. And, and we, I didn't really get into it, but the, um, I said that we layer resources, we layer lesson plans. We've done two videos with the Learning Systems Institute, um, which was a great resource, and um, anchored those in uh, Florida standards and national standards. So it's, yeah, it's, it's not always the case that you can get people involved in, you know, research that involves a SEM or a magnet or whatever because of the training time that's required. You just can't allow people to, you know, even for us, we're taking pictures of things rather than saying, here's a pile of specimens collected 200 years ago, have at it. You know, there's a layer there of uh, insulation that the specimens have from, and, and you, you know, if you don't have an ability to insulate your sensitive electronics or whatever from the 15 year old that wants to help, then it's, you know, maybe it's not the ideal thing for you. I would add on to that too. Um, teachers are a, a really amazing resource. And like Ellen said, she can connect you to a variety of teachers, but if you think in terms of a high school teacher reaches over 100 students per year, if you develop a lesson for high school or if you, elementary school about 30 kids per year, um, you have a broader impact even if you only work with one teacher. The reach that they have with those students is pretty impressive. Um, and it can build on the idea of educating the future. Um, and we've seen some success uh, uh, in engineering where faculty in engineering have looked at developing a lesson plan and have we paired them with a teacher in the classroom and then they've worked with that teacher on it. Um, just like Ellen said, that way the teacher can use the education speak and lingo. Um, and I always highlight teachers as really impactful. Um, you could work with one REU per year, or you could work with one teacher and reach all of their students, essentially. I have a question. How, so it sounds like your, very, your programs are very well established school system so how you know that fine line between like research and education like you have an education program but yet you're you know, doing the pre and post surveys how do you get your foot in the door you know like how do you start with some of the schools and like get them the IRB approval and any suggestions or if you haven't worked with the IRP system yet start now because they're upgrading it and changing it completely and uh, the forms are going from one page to four page if you're if you have no idea what i'm talking about good for you um, if you do work with human subjects um, you have to get it approved by, by our um, human subject subjects institutional review board so we have um, that covered and then um, we do not do research in the schools if you want to go into the school you not only have to get an fsu um, approval for that, but then you have to get Leon County or whatever county you're working in. Leon County, and this might be too much information for everybody, but Leon County requires, they only give you a certain amount of time, so you would need to collect all of your research in, let's say, a three-month period of time, and you need to have all of the principals approve that, so you'd have to reach out to all of the principals and get that. So my suggestion would be to work with one of the already established programs, um, and there's there's a variety of camps that FSU runs, um, and I'm happy to, to keep, Ellen also knows all of those too, as opposed to trying to start something from scratch, um, or working with a school for a summer camp, um, it's a little bit more lenient. Evaluation, um, you don't have to have IRB approval for, but I like to have it because we also do research on our programs. Getting your foot in the door, I think it just starts with, uh, we've introduced our faculty to just one teacher, and then that teacher, it organically works from there, where the teacher can like say, okay, I have colleagues that would be interested in doing this, or if we know the topic that you're interested in or your discipline, we usually, I, and I say we, like Ellen's group, as well as my group, could connect you. We know more of the physical science side, but her group might know more of the biology side, and we could say, I know a teacher that would be definitely interested in working on this or um, helping you with something like this. Also, Jessica, on April 12th, we're having a workshop partnering with rural schools. So all the schools other than Leon County, basically. Um, so that's another way that you can meet some of the contacts at the schools. And that's at the training center um, on April 12th. <laughs> oh, good, cool. <laughs>
um, from 9 to 10 30 a.m. And the teachers too, um, that's going to be a better meeting them in person because email, sometimes the way that the school system's set up in their email, you'll get moved to their junk folder if you try to email them and they're never at their phone because they're in the classroom. So in person is probably the best way um, or if someone that knows um, them can connect you because uh, their email address is approved. That's something that often happens is that that just gets missed. Um, and the best time to work with them is also going to be the summer when they have some free time when school lets out. So it's good to reach out to them now and get some time scheduled with them um, in May and June. All of the um, like Googles that you mentioned for working in schools, is that if you're like doing research as part of, or is that also just if you're developing curriculum with the teacher? That's just for research. You can okay. develop curriculum and you don't need any of that approval. Okay, so if I like had a friend who's a middle school science teacher, I could just you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> you're fine. Cool. It's only if you don't want to study the people. Okay. Yeah, that's when you cross the line into lots right. and lots of paperwork territory. Yeah, if you, I've had two projects that I've had to get IRB approval on, and uh, they weren't for. They they were, they were focused on people's ability to do the. Uh, data creation part of this, and uh, I've also had a project that was that not got, didn't go through IRB, but it should have, and uh, let me tell you, it's really hard to publish on the other hand if you don't have IRB at the beginning. We were able to do it, but we had a, a co-author at UF who would already gotten blanket approval for something that you could consider what we did part of, but it's just, you really want to go to IRB first and make sure that it's either something that they need to approve or something they don't need right. to approve, and, and that, you know, the latter is pretty uh, great to know. <laughs> yeah. The NSF career reviewers are usually asked to answer one question. Do the, PI, do the PIs have um, a good evaluation plan for success? So that means it's a very important question. Is it enough to say that we, FSU, already have existing educational programs, we have existing procedures for uh, evaluation such as pre- and the post-surveys or interviews with uh, the participants? We just follow the procedure. Would that be enough, or we should elaborate on that? That was my first question. I will have a follow-up question. I've never sat on a career grant um, review, so I can't answer that exactly. But I think you could probably talk to your um, NSF program officer um, and have that conversation. So if you were to do an activity in one of our programs, we could give you the data for your participants or the full review. And then you'd have to ask the career um, grant representative if that would be enough. Um, and there could be some language that you could use in your proposal of this is the evaluation that's happening. If it's a larger grant, so if you wanted to do um, a curriculum development, you'd probably want to put some money into that evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, so it wouldn't, you couldn't just like, Carrie couldn't just volunteer to do that, like along with all of her other things. And I think part of what NSF wants to see is not only the dis description of what you're going to do, but that you put money in that category as well. And that's why, like, Carrie's here too, because there are evaluators in um, Tallahassee that you could hire um, and provide some some funding for to demonstrate that. And they'd be, and they, if you have an idea, it's best to start working with the evaluator at the beginning because they need to know your goals and mission and, and all of those pieces. And if you're doing something that's drastically different than the program, so if you had, it's like, if you had sponsored REUs that went through our REU program, that's fine to use our evaluation for that. But if you're doing your own REU program, you need to have your own evaluation plan. Mm -hmm. So if you're kind of tagging on to an existing program, I'd say it might be okay, but still check with program officer. But if it's even only tangentially related, you're gonna wanna have your own plan that point. Mm -hmm. and you might want to look at some of the project, the programs that have 
you know, potentially have a, a more complete description than the career materials. Like, um, you know, I, I did an advance, uh, advancing informal STEM learning proposal two years ago, and that has a fairly extensive description of what you should be, you should have in that evaluation description. Uh, so I would say, I, I would say, yeah, my experience is, in that case, I, I wasn't going through any existing uh, program here at FSU, and I, I had to describe my evaluation pretty thoroughly. Um, fortunately, I had a co-PI on that that had some experience with that, and uh, she, she did a good job of, of um, polishing up my really raw description of it. I mean, it, there's language that you really should be using if you want people who know evaluation to take it seriously. And, and if you go to the, that, that um, advancing informal STEM learning uh, program could be a resource. There are certainly others that are focused on broadening participation or science communication or other things that you could find on the NSF website that'll have some more complete description of what they like to see when you're describing the activity that you're proposing for your broader impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think Ellen said before that there are red flags for people who know that kind of stuff that kind of sell you out as like you don't know what you're doing. So you want to avoid some of those like mm -hmm. trouble areas for sure. If a PI propose create and the poster surveys of uh, K through 12, do they need to do the human subject subject paperwork? Are you studying the people, or are you just evaluating your broader impacts programs? Just evaluating the, the, pro, the Then no, you don't need to. Okay. Only if the outcome of your project is the people themselves. So if you're studying the people, mm -hmm. yes. If you're just evaluating the program, no. Um, so, what is, and you may have touched on this in, in your presentations already, um, but maybe elaborating on it, um, what is something that you, for, for someone who's totally new to the process of grant writing and, and figuring out broader impacts, what is the one thing that you would want them to know, or, or something that you wish you would have known when, when starting out? <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> I, I think the best thing to do is to read other people's broader impacts um, and you provided everybody with copies of successful grants because I think that gave me a perspective of also what's innovative as opposed to what it, it already exists. You know, like taking on an intern, what would make an internship innovative? Um, that to me is always the buzzword for NSF and sometimes it's hard um, in the past we've done this and I remember there's a faculty member and she was like I just don't understand what would be innovative here's what I do and she described what she did and I was like that's really cool and here's how that could be innovative so it's having a conversation with someone probably that can get you outside of like I don't know what I'm like I don't, I don't understand this and, and help you to understand it but the reading the other ones is really helpful for me I would definitely read about broader impacts in the grant proposal guide and in the other literature, you know, it's a, it's, it's an important thing to have. They just des describe the weighting of the two, you know, intellectual merit and broader impacts as being equal. So it's an important thing to have, uh, but it's such a grab bag of stuff. I mean, it's, you've got the research and that's fairly easy to narrow down, but then you've got the broader impacts, which could look like a lot of different things, and, and it's just a matter of making sure that you're, uh, you're carefully reading through what they have to say about broader impacts, and um, making sure that you're, you know, a certain amount of it is echoing things that they're, they're saying about broader impacts, and, and making sure that you're, uh, you know, it's not copy and paste, it's just I hear them making this point in the, in the document, am I sufficiently addressing that in my 
proposal. And, and uh, like I said, it, you know, your broader impacts could be could be education. It could be something completely different. Um, and this is a handout. Actually, after talking with you, Austin, we uh, made a handout of some of the information on the NSF website about some different uh, broader impacts activities and then what they might be looking for. So definitely grab one of those if you don't already have it. We have a, a handout out here. It's like a little graphic that we use at the Mag Lab for our faculty because I think also sometimes people think when they think broader impact, they think education. And like Austin said, there's so much more to it. The citizen science is one field, but it also has to be what's authentic to you. So if you don't want to work with middle school students, then don't, well, don't work with middle school students. You know, There's a variety of ways that you can do that. It could be communicating, um, using WFSU, yes. Um, we have, uh, there's a number of opportunities here at FSU for people to film stuff for you. You can create video excerpts. Um, Learning System Institute, I can't, um, I want to piggyback on that. That's another great organization associated with FSU that Austin mentioned. Um, and the Florida Center for Interactive Media is a um, group here, Florida Center for Inter Interactive Media. A really great group to work with. They're, they're out in an entirely park. grant funded, so they're here to support grants. Mm -hmm. Um, so they'll definitely help you out. Developing apps, videos, so all kinds of stuff. Your, you put rhythm into your budget. Yes. Yes. Cool. Yep. yes. Um, and those are all things that are beyond, so you might not even have to interact with, you know, four-year-olds if that's not who you want to work with. Or if you want to work with four-year-olds, do it. But um, it gives you a sense of what's out there, um, even like blogging, um, all of these things. And there are people here at FSU that can help you with creating that. So it kind of broaden your idea of what broader impact is, and that's kind of a good way to, to look at those ideas. So that there are some words or phrases that might be useful to you when you're searching for NSF's thoughts on activities. So broadening participation is one of them. Um, you know, informal education is what I was talking about, and I think most of us were talking about informal education rather than formal education setting. Um, but also science communication, um, that's describing a lot of what we talked about with blogs and other, other things, um, I don't know, are there other, other umbrella terms that fit underneath broader impact activities? Science literacy. Science literacy. Mm -hmm. Public participation in, in scientific research is another way that NSF calls sort of what refers to citizen science. Um, and they made a big push in that area three years ago. Um, so you'll find a letter, you know, they send these letter, letter to colleagues, and there's a, there's a nice letter on public participation in scientific research, if that's your, your interest. And go, go to the big ideas. You know, they, uh, they have these 10 big ideas. I think it's 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you can link into one of those or several of those with both your intellectual uh, merit and your broader impacts, that's, that's going to be powerful. Thank you so much for coming out and speaking with us, everyone. Um, and I think, unless, Rachel, do you have anything? Um, um, just share. make sure to grab um, the upcoming events, the schedule for upcoming events. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.